Yes, the controversial word that will spark a landslide of different emotions in almost anyone. Some people use anime as an escape from the world of politics. Wrong! You cannot watch anime without- Okay, clearly I'm joking. I've been a One Piece fan for nearly a decade now and really relate to the feelings of those people who use it as an escape from politics or just the craziness of the world. But with a series such as One Piece, a series with heavy political undertones, I think that an examination of these themes can teach us a lot about real world issues and how to better approach them. I believe One Piece is a great series that inspires empathy as well as perspectives that some people might be more hesitant to engage with outside of the show. Also, I'm a nerd who's always wanted to do a political analysis on One Piece. Anyway, there may be a few viewers who will draw their own conclusions about me, but I'm going to try and stay away from my own personal politics. As someone with my own political perspective, I want to acknowledge that I absolutely carry certain biases, and they might slip out from time to time throughout the video, but I'm going to try and stay as objective as possible with my analysis. My recommendation to those that might have their guard up is to analyze. Use my analysis as a tool for your own analysis to better strengthen your understanding of different topics, whatever your perspective may be on them. I'm going to be exploring topics that relate to many political issues and using my analysis to draw correlations. I'm no expert by any means and I'm still a student and learning myself, so I'm totally open to input in the comments. All I ask is that you watch the full video before making any sort of judgment or maybe a decision to smash that subscribe button. Before we discuss more specific correlations and why Oda could be a communist, let's go ahead and break down the political and economic systems in One Piece. The world government in One Piece gives off the appearance of a cooperative effort between 50 different prolific kingdoms and the Five Elder Stars, aka the Gorosei, that maintain the power balance of the world. They represent a small group of individuals known as the Celestial Dragons, aristocratic descendants of the original 20 monarchs who created this system 800 years ago. This also grants them inherited power to influence the world in whatever way they choose without interference from the 50 kingdoms. They will frequently manipulate information spread through the world news organization adhering to their political agenda, as well as promote propaganda for the different factions of power the world government controls. All right, so let's paint a picture. 800 years ago, 20 kingdoms each supplant a sword around an empty throne in their home atop the red line. This gesture was supposed to represent that no one person ruled the world. However, it's revealed later in the story that a single being has higher authority than the five elders. This person is known as Eam. We don't really know anything about this figure yet, but their existence turns what would be an aristocracy into a global monarchy, an authoritarian regime. Even though the five elders and Eam have the highest known authority, it's shown to us that the 50 kingdoms can still make world-changing decisions without their approval. But being a celestial dragon in one piece is the equivalent to being a god. The 50 kingdoms might have the power to influence the world's politics, but the celestial dragons have the power to influence the 50 kingdoms, as well as the other 170 kingdoms affiliated with the world government. We don't know the systems in which which all of these different kingdoms operate, but the majority of the ones we do know of are ruled over by a royal bloodline or rather a monarchy. There is an exception to that though with Sakura Kingdom, once formerly known as Drum Island. Dalton, the king or president of that island, is currently the only known democratic leader that we know of. In conclusion, the political power structure of the world government is an authoritarian monarchy, with each subservient country implementing its own variation of monarchy, or in Drum Island's case, a republic. The the main defensive wing of the world government designed in a way to serve the wishes of the celestial dragons is known as the navy or also known as the marines. Because the celestial dragons are inherently corrupt, the navy is also corrupt as a consequence. Our first demonstration of this is with Axe Hand Morgan at the beginning of the series. Oda uses Kobe, someone who wants to join the navy, as a narrative device to show the readers that the black and white idea of bad guys and good guys is not how the world works, and that there are systematic reasons behind every character's moral code, personal philosophy, and actions, all things that can grow and evolve over time. The Marines are responsible for much of the oppression that takes place in territories across the One Piece world. One example is the island of Ohara, which was destroyed along with everybody who resided there, simply because their vast knowledge of the world's government secrets had threatened the current power structure. Another great example being the Heavenly Tribute, a payment quota to the Celestial Dragons that's required by every government-affiliated kingdom in order to ensure naval protection. Protection. In feudalism, the monarch would grant the peasants land in exchange for their labor. They complied or they starved. In One Piece, the world government grants military protection in exchange for a universal quota. They comply or pirates pillage and destroy their land and or they starve to death. But we'll get into the economic consequences of this shortly. 
A smaller and more secret defense organization of the world government is Cypherpol. Agents of Cypherpol are planted in different territories around the world to keep tabs on anybody who might be going against the will of the world government. Those who are unfortunately caught by undercover Cypherpol agents will usually become targets of assassination. Through espionage, they make sure secrets the world government once kept are kept. The other two powers that make up this global power structure are one, the Seven Warlords, a group of selected pirates affiliated with the world government that are granted pirating privileges without the interference of the Navy in exchange for a cut of the money they accumulate and their power when needed. And then there's two, the four pirate emperors of the sea, with just one or two of them being able to rival the military might of the Navy. The warlords and emperors are both known for taking over different countries, which adds even more to the corrupt nature of this current system. As a consequence of the corrupted global government and their system, there have been other factions across the One Piece world that have started to gain prominence and power, throwing the world government's balanced system into chaos. The Revolutionary Army, a group that's been growing in the shadows and now have gained enough power to begin striking back against the world government. SWORD, a secret organization within the Navy that consists of Marines who are working to reform the defensive wing of the world government from the inside. Pirates like Luffy who strive to uphold freedom and believe that humans have basic necessities that should be met no matter what the power structure is. His anarchistic mindset stands in direct opposition to the world government who hold power and wealth over the needs of ordinary citizens, which is why Luffy will stop at nothing to bring down the system that is preventing his friends from eating a good meal, living in good homes, and assured good protection. Okay, minor manga spoilers for like 10 seconds only. Skip forward if you do not want to hear this. There's also the newly introduced Cross Guild, a group of ex-warlords who were disbanded and targeted by the Navy after being replaced by the SSG, aka Special Science Group. These guys are now flipping the script and putting bounties on Marines. This leads to even more unrest since the civilians now have a tool to gain money from attacking their own oppressors. The economic system is extremely unique in One Piece, being that there is a universal currency used from island to island and country to country. This currency in Japanese is known as Betty. Only islands detached from the global system have adopted their own currency, some of which being Skypea, Totoland, Wano, and Amazon Lily. In a nutshell, each island still implements their own distribution of funds dependent on their economic structure. But the world government still acts as the ultimate accumulator and printer of the universal currency currency, giving them primary ownership over all the wealth in affiliated nations. Due to the isolated nature of the world's islands, a trade system is virtually non-existent with only a few islands implementing it as a necessity, Water 7 being a great example. Countries are heavily reliant on producing and maintaining their own goods and services based on the resources they have in their respective territory. So when a country like Alabasta has a climate disaster that prevents harvests or water collection, the nation will inevitably fall into chaos. And since affiliated countries have to rely on the heavenly tribute to ensure protection from pillagers, their wealth granted by production that could be used to better their own country is stolen by the celestial dragons, leaving many nations food insecure or unprotected. Countries that have much less wealth to offer, even if they're more abundant with other resources such as food, will have a much harder time meeting the quota. This unbalanced global economic system leaves an excess amount of unused wealth at the top and a lack of wealth for the majority of different nations across the world. It's unique in the sense that it relies on a global currency, yet lacks the economic infrastructure to influence the accumulation of wealth in its affiliated nations. All of these countries are independent to create their own economic system, but are still dependent on that system to generate the necessary amount of wealth that the world government requires of them. The system feels a lot like what I would term global feudalism. Feudal in the sense that each country is granted protection by the military and land through the wealth they accumulate. In addition, all other surplus value not given to the world government can be put back into their own system. Because virtually all countries in the One Piece world are run by monarchies, the capitalist economic system, socialist economic system, and communist economic system are probably not organizations conceptualized yet by the people residing in it. However, that does not take away from the traits of capitalist, socialist, and communist ideology within characters and themes of the story, which is where I would like to lead this analysis to next.
Let's talk human conditioning. The process of accustoming a person to act a certain way or to accept certain circumstances. Prior to the recent surge of revolutionary optimism in the story, the normal citizens of the One Piece world have been conditioned to take the oppressive hand of the world government without second guessing it. There are a multitude of reasons regarding why this lack of pushback exists. One, some nations still live decently under the rule of the world government, which correlates to a lack of urgency and an oblivion towards those who suffer more, not by any fault of their own, but because of the system that they were born into. Two, kingdoms across the One Piece world are systematically designed in a way that limits their knowledge and education, which correlates to a psychological disconnect from their material realities. Three, fear. Those who are more aware of the corrupt system, as well as their lack of power and influence as individuals, like those on Sabati, are also more prone to comply out of their fear of being starved or killed. The cause is the global system, and some of the effects are these reasons. This is the nature of authoritarianism. The more educated, fearful, and disconnected the people are, the easier it is for the world government to take advantage and extract wealth and labor from them. So even though their lives could be better if everyone came together and struck back against the world government, as we are seeing now, this learned behavior, or rather conditioned behavior, led to a population of very subservient people. The understanding of conditioning as an analytical tool gives one the means of adequately understanding and addressing certain issues. It's a term I'm going to be using very frequently for correlations like the one I have next, world government exceptionalism. Within the population of any country, there is always going to be a group of citizens who hold a certain amount of exceptionalism for their government, regardless of its flaws. This reactionary sentiment is usually born out of a mix between unrecognized privilege, a lack of awareness, and false information embedded as a part of their culture due to an overexposure to propaganda. You can see this exceptionalist attitude in characters such as Steli, who have used their privilege as an aristocrat to rise in the totem pole of power, or citizens in countries like Dressrosa and Alabasta, who held pride in their respective warlords' rule as a consequence of their manipulation. Exceptionalist behavior will often lead to a psychological barrier that stops other information, true or false, that may have a negative outlook on specific things they feel pride for from disrupting their beliefs. A great example of what a person with an exceptionalist mindset would say is something like, our system for making donuts is the best there is, even if there's proof directly in front of their face saying Katakuri Chef makes better donuts than your system does. Mm. If I were to ask you, the viewer, what motivated you to watch this video, what would you say? Most likely, you were intrigued by the title and thumbnail. If I also asked why you watched this far through, you might say because you found some sort of value in this video. This is how we all operate as human beings. Our actions each have some sort of psychological cause behind them determined by our different material realities. Oda, the author of One Piece, and any great storyteller for that matter, has an understanding of this concept. And this is why Oda makes great One Piece characters. Let's apply this real-life concept to characters and factions within the story. Each correlation will start off with a question. Why does S.W.O.R.D. exist? Why are members of the Navy creating their own secret inner organization? The obvious answer is because the Marines function under a corrupt system, however there is more depth to the rise of S.W.O.R.D. than simply the corrupt system itself. Let's take a look at this marine from the navy base in Shellstown during the first arc of One Piece Romance Dawn. Under the command of Axe Hand Morgan, these marines are required to commit acts that may go against their own personal morality, but to go against their captain is to go against the method of absolute justice informed by the naval system. This idea of absolute justice is what trains the morally conflicted good marines like this one into doing things that in any other circumstance they could never imagine themselves doing. So in order to make any sort of change to the system that they are employed under, S.W.O.R.D. is forced to work in secrecy. If compromised, they would be subject to the same fate as this poor marine from Shellstown. Why do revolutions happen? The French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Communist Revolution of Russia. These are all examples of a group of oppressed individuals who have gained enough influence or power to fight back against the hand that oppresses them. The basic essential needs for human survival boil down to just a few things, food, water, and shelter. Within a corrupt system that leads to a depletion of these basic needs, hides history, oppresses citizens, and has a huge disparity of wealth, you are going to have a lot of people who, given the 
opportunity will want to fight back. But to simply want to fight back isn't enough to create change. History as it's taught in the real world will sometimes tend to glorify individuals as the sole reason for revolutionary outcomes, when that's just simply not the case. Revolutions only happen when those who are oppressed are able to unite as a collective, because the collective oppressed majority will always hold more power than the rich and powerful minority. A revolution succeeds through a step-by-step -step process, which is why you don't see the Revolutionary Army waging a full-scale war at the beginning of the series, despite their known opposition. The process in which revolution becomes viable is long and extremely strategic. You start from grassroots, organizing and creating factions in different parts of the corrupt system. Factions that focus on education, inspiring revolutionary optimism, and demonstrating the value of the oppressed to the oppressors. Once the Revolutionary Party has galvanized enough people and creates a multifaceted structure that has a plan of action, the revolution can then commence. This is an extremely simplified way of explaining the complexity that comes with organizing a revolution. But you can still see clear examples of this all throughout One Piece. Alabasta, Wano, and even just Rosa, these are just some examples. What drove Arlong to oppressing Nami's hometown? What drove Hody Jones to reject his own kind and push for separation rather than integration? What terrible circumstances could drive an entire nation of people to flee in fear from the world above? Racist mentality conditioned into the people of the One Piece world have led to the enslavement and trafficking of the Fishmen race. Due to being targeted by the world nobles and virtually every other faction of people, the Fishmen fled undersea, making it much more difficult for land dwellers to apprehend them. Unfortunately, there were still ways of traveling to their new home, Fishman Island, leaving the doors open for foreign aggression. Luckily, the Fishman people have been able to gain the protection of pirate emperors such as Whitebeard, Big Mom, and now Luffy. And as time passes, the racist sentiment among Fishmen is becoming more and more deprogrammed as they slowly integrate themselves into the world. But even if there's noticeable improvements happening, there still remains many serious issues. Fishmen on land are much more likely to be violently targeted as we saw on Sabadi. Slavery still exists, and fishmen on the surface are still considered a commodity. Even though the Ryugu dynasty has incorporated themselves within the system that oppresses them, the real changes that they want are not changes the world government is ready to accept. This extremely slow and rugged pathway to change is not a path that sat right with many fishmen. Where figures such as Odahime wanted to petition for integration, you have other figures such as Fisher Tiger who wanted to bring the fight directly to them. Fisher Tiger was not a revolutionary, but he still was a man of action. In the golden age of piracy in the real world, being a pirate was one of the only ways of gaining wealth, power, and a feeling of freedom as a black person. This drive for adventure and freedom is something that Fisher Tiger embodied. During his incredible adventures as a pirate, he would free the slaves at the heart of the world from the celestial dragons, only to become a slave himself and witness the true evil the world government still strives to uphold. Oda presents multiple different philosophical ideologies for Fishman characters, but the most important thing to consider is the motivations and conditions that drove these characters to think in the way that they do. Fisher Tiger, as good intentioned as he was, still held so much hatred in his heart for humans, so much so that he allowed himself to die instead of accepting a human blood transfusion. Arlong saw himself and other Fishmen as the superior race and would go on to subject humans in a part of the world that was weaker and easier to oppress. Arlong goes as far as to even make bribes with the local navy in order to keep Nami as a slave. And Hody Jones, someone who was a product of an environment ignored by the Ryugu dynasty, grew up with hatred for humans despite never experiencing direct subjugation himself. He only knew of the sentiment carried by fishmen he lived with. His hatred would lead him to killing his own queen, the only person fighting and succeeding in creating positive change, because he didn't want there to be positive change. He wanted to reverse the roles and subjugate humans like Arlong. These ideologies, these feelings, all stem from the conditions placed upon the fishmen by humans. And now humans in the One Piece world are tasked with the responsibility of accepting fishmen as people and giving them the freedom that they deserve. One Piece portrays racism in a very philosophically nuanced way, with a focus on conditioning and the motivations of people, but it still leaves solutions ambiguous as it is up to the viewer to make that analysis for themselves. I think that it's important to recognize that racism as it pertains to issues is much more complex than in the story of One Piece. It's definitely not a guidebook on larger systemic issues, but it sets the groundwork for deeper evaluation and understanding, which I think are both very important lessons to learn.
Okay, so I came across this Reddit thread while researching topics for this video, which tries to draw correlations between One Piece and communism. Although the analysis is extremely well thought out and thorough, I think there is some room for criticism and further analysis. Straight off the bat, I just want to say my perspective is no. I don't believe Oda is a Marxist, and I don't really think it's possible to confidently draw this conclusion based on the world that he's created. You can absolutely draw correlations between elements of the One Piece story and the ideas of Karl Marx, who I should also add seems to be the inspirational figure for this member of the Gorosei. However, I think the correlations made fail to consider Oda's use of feudalism, ideology, and the lack of capitalist and communist economics within the world of One Piece. Let's go ahead and take a look at the arguments. I'm not going to dive incredibly deep into Karl Marx's theory of economics, but to give an understanding to those who might not know much about Marx's theory, he is more known for his critique of the capitalist organization of the economy. A part of his critique included how the capitalist system divides people people by two distinct classes, respectively termed the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, and the proletariat, the working class. The writer mentions how the celestial dragons are comparable to the ruling class, while the working class would be the average working citizen of One Piece. I actually agree with the idea that the world government in One Piece is a bourgeoisie government, but despite living in the shadow of a much bigger legal and economic system, these countries still implement feudal forms of economics, further alienating the worker from their means of production. So as bad as the world government is, the world of One Piece hasn't even made the transition into considering democracy as Marx would define it. But I think the more important thing to keep in mind here is that the story's central focus does not revolve around its economics. Although Oda may incorporate class consciousness and class struggle as it pertains to the global system, the solution to it focuses on the ideology of freedom and independence, and that no one central force can rule the world. A concept that's much broader and much simpler than the economics of communism. This point ties together even further when looking at the Revolutionary Army in One Piece. The writer brings up the correlations between the Revolutionary Army in One Piece and the revolution of the proletariat discussed in Marx's theory. As we touched on earlier, a revolution is almost always bound to happen to any society when people's basic needs are stripped away from them and the government they live under oppresses and or kills them. Revolution as a concept was not created simply as a pathway to communism. Revolution has always existed and was only adopted by Marx as a strategic step towards achieving communism. The Revolutionary Army is not fighting for the liberation of workers within these countries. They are not fighting for a stateless, classless future. As far as we know, they don't even have new economic policies they plan to implement after toppling the world government. What they are fighting for is an end to the global dominion that oppresses all nations of the world, giving every country its independence. The revolution in One Piece is centered more more on the ideology of the series we previously discussed, rather than the proletarians of the series achieving any sort of true democracy. Okay, so what the heck is dialectical materialism and was Oda inspired by it? The theory states that historical and political events are a result of the conflict of social forces and are interpretable as a series of contradictions and their solutions. To make the theory a bit more digestible, here's a couple of One Piece examples. The revolutionary koala, who was once a slave deprived of basic human needs due to the political system eventually makes the decision to join the revolutionary army. Her decision to join came from her time as a slave and her time as a slave came as a consequence of the system. Another example being the people of Alabasta who were deprived of water. They were convinced that it was due to Cobra stealing the rainwater so they decided to strike back against the government. So if we were to analyze this through a materialistic lens, they decided to revolt against their government after forming the revolutionary army out of a consequence of not having rainwater. In other words, these events all occurred due to issues within the system that led them to these decisions. Analyzing the story in this manner through dialectical materialism is something we who have an understanding of the concept are prone to do no matter what we are consuming. So I think it's important to acknowledge if you're a Marxist or anybody who has an understanding of dialectical materialism that almost any character in a story under a corrupt government can be analyzed in this way. It doesn't mean Oda wrote the story with dialectical materialism materialism in mind, it just means that he has a pristine understanding of how people think, how they act, and what political conditions lead them to do so. This point is further enforced by the idealistic natures of his characters like Luffy. 
Anarchism is a philosophy that revolves around the abolition of the government and a skepticism towards any type of authority that tries to justify itself. It's a philosophy much more focused on action rather than taking things step by step. Luffy's ideas of freedom and his tendency towards direct action aligns with the ideology of anarchism, and also the other way that Luffy thinks where everybody should be able to have the food that they need and every member of his crew having their own specific role to play. With all of this in mind, the one bit of communist inspiration in One Piece could come from Luffy resembling a communist anarchistic ideology. Luffy wants to create a world where everybody can eat, a world where nobody is starving. But again, don't forget that Luffy's idea of this was not conceived through any material analysis, it's just his ideology, which simply resembles some elements of Marxist theory. I believe that the political endgame of One Piece will see the end of the global ruling class and the birth of true freedom for nations across the world. Pirating will still be outlawed and marines will still exist. However, as countries rebuild and improve their economic systems, pirating will eventually fade away as well as the marines since material conditions will continue to improve and they will no longer be needed. The united countries of the world will now have control over how the marines operate instead of the marines having dominance over their kingdoms. Thus, the defensive force will be utilized in the best interest of collective society. Over time, the independent countries of the world will most likely begin to adopt economic systems like capitalism, socialism, and communism, but the One Piece world has an extremely feudal, monarchical, and authoritarian political structure. That goes for the world government and all of the countries it oppresses. It's pretty safe to say that Oda isn't a fascist or anything, since his whole story revolves around the abolition of a fascist regime, but whether or not Oda is a communist isn't really something we can know for sure. I mean, maybe by the time we get to the end of the series and we see how the world looks in the future, but not at this current point in the story. If One Piece ends and they've actually instituted a communist system, then I will absolutely concede to any Marxist who said I told you so. Until then though, this is my perspective. Some people might point out that I didn't really mention propaganda, which is definitely a huge thing in One Piece. I just felt like propaganda deserved its own video. So make sure you're subscribed, have that notification bell ring, and definitely check out this video next. Go ahead and join the Discord server as well for more direct connection with me and other people in this community. There will be a link in the description.